you were kind of explaining how our memories reconstruct our experiences on DMT mm. and different types well, of things. Well, not on DMT, but but um, other psychedelics. Yeah, and and in, in the dream state. So so the, okay, yeah. so that's that's perfect. Mm. It doesn't happen on DMT. Mm. So like two weeks ago, when I or a couple weeks ago, whenever it was, I did DMT last. The first like I did it. I told you earlier. I was I did it three different times. I like went in three times where I did like six hits entered the fucking DMT world. Six? I think it was six. Yeah. It's, it's cool. It wasn't the free base. It was just a little vaporizer thing. Mm -hmm. The first time I closed my eyes, I see aliens doing ballet right in front of me. Like these creatures, not vivid, but they were just doing ballet spinning. They were wearing tutus. Nice. And then the second time I did it again, and I was looking for the code in the laser. Yeah. And then I did it a third time. And I told you, I saw just like a billion dicks that were etched <laughs> in the sort of Sanskrit type code. So did I see this stuff? Because I've heard endless amounts of people talking about seeing aliens on DMT and was expecting to see code in the laser. And I had sort of a preconceptual idea of what I was going to experience on this. Like if I had none of this, if I was mm. coming in blank, mm. would I see the same stuff? Um, it's, it's hard to answer definitively. I mean, we know that expectation and your, your set, um, what you expect, your, your brain, as I said before, your brain, your brain is a predictor. It kind of, it, it, it yeah. decides what it expects to see and then it tests it against sensory inputs. I mean, um, the thing about DMT is that it, it, it often seems to transcend all of that. So it seems in many ways entirely independent of set and setting. Set and setting actually become largely irrelevant in many cases. Most people aren't expecting what they, I mean, in a way it's almost impossible to expect what you experience under the influence of DMT. Could there be an influence, um, you know, expectation, could expectation, prediction influence the DMT state? Maybe. Um, but often I think it, it just completely transcends that. Now, were you expecting to, to see aliens doing ballet? No. Were you expecting to see aliens? No. But you could say aliens could be similar to elves. They didn't look like elves. They looked like aliens doing ballet. But it's similar, right? It's a similar kind of archetype. Okay. So... Let's take the elves, for example. Now, the idea that it's expectation that makes you see elves, this is very commonly used as an explanation uh, for why people see elves. Particularly Terence McKenna is given the blame for this. Right. Um, Terence McKenna often spoke about elves. Um, uh, first of all, what do we mean by an elf? It's broadly, some kind of small being that's mm -hmm. lively, that's jovial, that down dances around, bounds around, uh, often in great numbers. So multitudinous mm. uh, beings, right? Um, so Terence McKenna described these, and he's given the blame then. So people, they listen to Terence McKenna, they expect to see elves, yeah. then they smoke DMT. They he's polluted the- He's uh, polluted, yeah. right? The kind of the, um, the meme sphere or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, now, does that make sense? Well, it could make sense but then so let's take the timeline let's draw the timeline backwards pre mckenna um we go into let's say the, the first dmt study ever in the 1950s Stephen zara hungarian physician injected hmm. dmt into himself uh, he lived in hungary at the time um or in, in budapest i believe that's in hungary right I'm not being stupid. I have no idea. Yeah, yeah. You're asking the wrong guy. Anyway, um, he discovered the psychedelic effects of DMT. Mm -hmm. um, and in his very first study, one of his subjects, who was, a, a, I think, a nurse who worked at the hospital where he was working, she saw small beings that moved around very, very quickly. She, she described them as like dwarves. But again, it's the same motif. Lots of little beings that move around very, very quickly. Hmm. We can we can draw the line back even further. We go to the Amazonian rainforests, uh, the Yanomami, a particular very large group, an indigenous group in, in, in South America. They describe when taking their um, DMT-based drugs, um, Epena, uh, Yopo, 
So these come from, so yopo comes from, is a, the ground seeds of a tree called uh, Anadenanthera peregrina. They grind up these seeds uh, to form a powder and then they, they snort it. Or in fact, they, they put in a, have you heard about this? They, a long tube up to like a yard long. You still use yards in this part of the world? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, about a yard long and they fill it with you know, up, sometimes like one or two teaspoons of this powder and then it goes into your nose Whoa. and then I blow it for mm -hmm. like a shotgun mode of administration, fires it into your, into your head. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've heard of this. Yeah, you've heard of this. Mm -hmm. um, there's another one called a pena, which comes from the, uh, the, the dried resin of a, of a spe uh, genus uh, called virola. And there are various species that are used that contain DMT, mm -hmm. right? Um, and these tribes, um, indigenous groups, if you like, um, describe seeing multitudinous beings that are so numerous that you can never get to the end of them, that are lively, that are brightly colored, that dance and sing, and they call them the Hekura. Um, and these are very important in their cosmology, in their way of seeing reality, and they, they kind of, they, they, they come dancing uh, when you, after inhaling this snuff, and they, they, they enter your chest and they fill your chest up and you have to keep them there and that, so your body is effectively becomes the home of these beings, which help you and protect you and guide you throughout your life. And then when you die, um, they exit, and they leave you again and they enter the forest and maybe they will enter another shaman or something like this. So you have a whole uh, mythos around beings that you might call elves, right? We would call them elves. They call them Hekura. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea that Terence McKenna is responsible for people seeing lively giggling beings, which he called machine owls, but really we're just talking about small beings that take various forms, but they're unified by their character. Mm. Um, it, it's not Terence McKenna. I mean, this, this goes back perhaps thousands of years, people mm. seeing the same kind of beings. Um, and you can say the same thing about mantids, you know, mantis type alien beings. Now this of course features in ufology and um, you know, uh, you know, alien abduction experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, the, the Yanomami, they have this, this one class of being that they see under the influence of these psychedelic drugs is called the Wadusinari, which are a fearsome insect-like being that will seize you and that will feed on the fat of children. I mean, it's really quite horrible. Yeah. Now, if you compare that to modern trip reports, people always describe these mantis-like beings and they, they almost always are, if not negative, at least kind of cold and ruthless and calculated. People describe being dismembered. You get these Ooh. dismemberment scenarios where their, their, their whole body is torn apart and their organs flung uh, away. And this then, is on what drug? DMT. Oh, really? Yes. This is very, it's quite a common or not, uh, certainly not a rare experience under the influence of psychedelics. And so you have people now in, in the modern era who have known nothing about shamanistic mythos, basically recapitulating these dismemberment reconstruction scenarios that are described by these indigenous peoples in South America that they have understood and experienced for hundreds, thousands of years. Um, so. It's not the idea that everything you experience under the influence of DMT is just because you've you've heard stories. Um, it just doesn't doesn't make any sense.